it's me again. And so I'm going to talk about where the research world is going and take a little bit of time to say what are the plans that we as a lipedema research community need, you know, need to put in place to sort of channel how we, how we manage our resources. But we can't really have that conversation without acknowledging the, like, the sophistication of what we're starting to hear in the research community. For those of you who have been at the FDRS conference year over year over year, I haven't been there with you. This is my second one. But I am reading the lipedema literature, and it's just really gratifying to see the types of studies that are coming out, the complexity and the nuance with their beginning to explore the lipedema community. Dr. Bellis mentioned it, but I'll certainly point, it's just absolutely terrific to have people like Melissa, who are junior scientists, fourth year of graduate school, being able to come up and express the level of complexity of the data that they are doing, which is just such a, so encouraging for, again, that nuance that will be able to be applied to lipedema in the future. All right, so I'm actually gonna begin my talk now. Still no disclosures, still the same disclaimer, still the same slide. Remember I said earlier, like, you know, there's that hockey stick graph of like just the incredible proliferation of data, which is exciting, still small relative to other fields. And one of the things I glossed over very quickly, like one of the things that quite frankly scares me about the lipedema field is that, you know, we, we want to pat ourselves on the back and say, you know, the Lipedema Foundation is the largest funder of research in the Lipedema community, and it parallels that of the NIH, but that shouldn't be the case. There should be much more money in the environment, and, like, the thing that scares me when I read the literature is that about half of the research that's out there has no funding at all declared behind it. And so that's a real concern for us because it does mean that's one of these big challenges to progress in research. And here's some other challenges. We continue to have a reliance on a clinical diagnosis. That means that we don't really have a good sense of the numbers behind the, the diagnosis. It's always going to be right now the opinions of the very skilled physicians in our community who have a lot of experience and no lipedema and have, a, have some ideas of the criteria that they use but those criteria may different, differ from practice to practice, training program to training program. We have hard problems in recruiting patients to lipedema studies. I mentioned we need to be having studies that are hundreds of patients, and mostly we're getting studies that have a dozen and two dozen patients. We need to get down on that characterizing the biology of the disease that you have heard about where people are going, like how they're actually getting into like the depth of detail for which we're trying to characterize the biology of the disease. We need to get more lipedema funding out there in the, you know, in the community. And we need to develop a network, an infrastructure to actually make this, this happen. So what does that mean for us? Well, in this community of limited resources and the challenges that we're discussing, we can't do everything. We can't study, and there's been so many wonderful questions in the app about, hey, is there research about this? Is there research about this? And there's just not enough resources to do all the research that we would love to see happening. So how do we actually coordinate that? How do we create a map that tells us what are gonna be our priorities and how do we get from where we are today to where we're going. So here's our approach. And one of the things that we felt very strongly about is that if I sit here and tell you what I think a research roadmap should be, I'm wrong. You know, I, I'm just one stakeholder in this community. I'm just one opinion. So how a research roadmap is gonna have to work for our surgical community, our patient community, our research community, our other clin non-surgical clinicians, our therapists, et cetera. So we began aggregating ideas from all of these different communities through our access that we have at the Lipedema Foundation to different representatives of these communities and put them together into a draft that's sort of a sourcing of all the ideas that have emerged. And we're now in a process of refining those to get to that level of prioritization. And I'm gonna be very honest, like the, this meeting that we're having here, as I go through some of the like high level ideas, we really want you all to be part of that process. Come and talk to us, come and say like, hey, this is what matters to me as a patient or as you know, whatever, your, whatever, whatever stakeholder capacity brings you to this meeting. 
And what we'll be doing in the near future is publishing that draft publication and opening it up for an open comment period such that everybody in the world can have an idea to contribute their ideas and have an open dialogue about where the, where the funding should be going. So here's how we've broken it down, and I hope it looks like that should be big enough to be readable. But we've broken it down into ideas of the environment and the infrastructure we need. How do we develop standards for the field? There's some vague notions in the field that we need to get a little bit more precise about how we talk about research that we would recommend being part of our roadmap. We need to develop new diagnostic tools, surely. We talk about that all the time. We need to characterize the biology of disease so that we can get biologically plausible interventions, uh, therapies in the future. Developing those you know, therapies relies on everything you saw above in the other categories. And we're getting to a stage where we really need to drill down on the epidemiology because you know, the numbers that we have on the epidemiology are really tough, you know, really tough to interpret. And we also need to be more sophisticated about the epidemiology in terms of like not just counting the number of people with lipedema, but understanding all of, their, all of their symptoms, all of their different diversity of their journeys with lipedema. So let's just start going through them. Let's talk about that environment and workforce. And the, the, the model I'm gonna have here is gonna show you an illustration of one of the problems and then start to talk about the challenges. And here's a diagram that's not just a bunch of Skittles on a table, that's actually every one of those people, every one of those circles represents an author in the last five years of uh, publications who has contributed data, not just ideas, but the data to the lipedema research community. And I think there's four, if I remember correctly, there's 400, my vision is bad, <laughs> I can barely read this myself, there's 408 dots on that, and they're all connected in some way, and the way that we describe is maybe being, you can think about maybe about 40 different groups in the world that are working on lipedema. And so that's not, that's not enough if that's our workforce. So our challenges in actually building an environment include the fact that our workforce is small, as I just showed you. We have barriers to entry. I showed you the funding situation earlier. We need more mentorship and training. We need more people like Melissa coming in and working with people who are senior in the, you know, senior in the field and could give them that training and on the medical side as well. Our recommendations, you know, are the things that, the things that address these challenges, you know, empowering and engaging patients, bringing additional stakeholders in, growing that workforce, growing that funding. I'm gonna keep going on it, like, okay, so here's something really complex. When we start talking about building standards in the field, you know, here's a little cartoon of a, of a piece of tissue, as we talk in, sometimes in terms of like, well, let's talk about adipose. Well, what adipose are we talking about? We need more precision in our language about, about lipedema research. So we're starting to say we need, we need some field criteria, some standards that when we see a paper in a, uh, in a publication, we know that they're going to show us their diagnostic criteria. They're gonna tell us what staging they're gonna use. They're gonna be very precise about what they're actually sampling at what level of the body. So these are some of the challenges that we have around our field standards right now, importing and telling us very clearly who's in the study, who's not in the study. And one thing, you know, things that we can begin to do, and one of the, the diagram I didn't tell you on the right, is starting to recommend that anybody who's participating in research consider this idea of a, of a common case report form that it might not get published in every study, but every study I read, I should be able to know that they collected all of this information. So when we see two studies that are similar, we can know there's a common denominator behind the scenes that we can go back and compare those studies. So that's what we mean about developing, developing standards. So my, uh, my, my partner in crime, Stephanie Peterson, went, went through and looked at all of the different, so this, this slide, the label of this seems to have gone off the screen here, but when we talk about developing new diagnostic tools, she went through and illustrated one of the things that we think, we talk about biomarkers and we say, okay, is that gonna be an on-off switch? Something that says like you either have lipedema or not. Well, what we need is we need to take a sort of a portfolio or a pipeline approach and think about all of our different possible tools that we would have according to what parts of the body, what aspects of lipedema they're surveying, at what degree of maturity are these technologies in the, idea, in, the, in the space of going from just an idea to a clinical reality. 
And by taking that portfolio approach, we can actually get to something that is likely to actually help, uh, help diagnose lipedema. Our challenges include this lack of meaningful measurements, the complexity, the, the diversity of the condition itself, and our strategic recommendations you know, really focus on that idea of taking that pipeline, that portfolio approach, and really cultivating and nurturing that so that, so that we have a diverse group of lots of different shots on goal in terms of actually getting us to a, uh, to a good diagnostic strategy that gives our physicians more than just their experience to rely on, it gives them some clinical decision support tools to actually inform that diagnosis in the future. Issues that we contend with in terms of uh, in terms of characterizing the biology of the disease. I don't know what happened with the template. It looks like we lost the top of the slides in some of these, but we're talking about characterizing biology of the disease. All these things that we talk about when we talk about the different symptoms of lipedema, the canonical symptoms, the non-canonical symptoms, we know that these. Uh, we know when we actually go and look in the literature. It's very broad, you know, what, uh, how many people have any particular type of symptom. We need to get more clear on what that is. We need to describe our lipedema population and its subgroups more clearly. We also need to focus on ideas of what initiates and what causes lipedema to progress. So we have an immature field. We have these issues with you know, really needing to go back and redefine some of the symptoms really focusing on things like what Sarah was talking about and, uh, and how my hormones might initiate, but what are the other initiating triggers of lipedema? There are a number of questions about traumas and such that could potentially you know, be out there, might, maybe initiating lipedema. We also need to get really serious about our models. We are wonderful in the you know, uh, fat in a dish model that Dr. Bellis was describing for us, we need other models like animal models that will help us get to, like we, when I talk, spoke earlier, we talked about correlation versus causation. It'll be those models that help us actually answer that causation aspect of, of lipedema. Therapies. When we start talking about therapies, this is a wonderful diagram produced by the friends at FDRS, and it describes all those things that all of you all are doing in your daily life, many of them exploring on your own. We don't have a good way of aggregating all of the data that comes from all of those to actually know what, what is going to be effective, what is going to be safe. You know, for a broad group of people. And so one therapy may work very well for one person, but we really have a lack of data about what's going to generalize to a whole population. And so we need ways of, uh, of aggregating that data because we can't possibly go out and run a clinical trial on everything you all are doing you know, and testing in your own lives. So we're looking at ideas about ex exploring like how to actually aggregate, aggregate that data how to get meaningful outcomes into our clinical research, and again, kind of like that diagnosis, supporting a really broad therapeutic pipeline. So this is back to the end of the of talk. Where are we now needing your feedback? So we're around, come talk to us. Come tell us about what it is that you want to see the lipedema field doing. Ask us questions in the app, in real life, and uh, get connected. Come, come read our blogs, join with us on social media. We have time for a few questions. Oh, great. Yes. We have a lot of guy. You might win the award for having the most questions asked in the app. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> And for those of you who haven't been following along, um, Guy has been responding to as many questions as he's been able to, so we really appreciate that. Um, one question that was asked and that I thought would be really, um, received a lot of response was, I'm interested in research affecting quality of life for existing patients. What can be done to regain mobility once it's been lost? Yeah, I mean, obviously a fantastic, a fantastic question. I mean, I think the first place we need to start is I, I love the, the idea that we're talking about mobility. A lot of our clinical trials for the, the studies that are out there ask questions about things like leg volume. You know, but really what people are wondering is like, is leg volume the right measurement or is it something like how do you use those legs? How does it contribute to mobility? 
I think people in this room have done much, you know, are, are really the experts. I know Dr. Wright has published, you know, I, I'm, I'm calling him out. I, he, I saw him looking at his phone, so I'm going to call him out now because <laughs> he wasn't listening. But he published this year on using some, uh, co you know, conservative therapy and the benefits to quality of life that could happen. Uh, the, the physical therapist, the occupational therapist can really answer the more clinical questions, but everything is pointed to those conservative therapies and, the, and uh, in, including the work that our physical therapists, occupational therapists could do is actually having a generalizable effect. And so I'd, uh, I encourage you to talk to those clinical providers. Fantastic. Lipedema research has sprouted wheels and taken off the past few years. Do you anticipate the research will continue to pick up steam and acceptance in the near future? Yeah, of course. I think there's a lot to be hopeful about. I think what's going to be necessary is to begin speaking in the terms of the other research funders out there. And so right now, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of money to do research at the Lipidema community. So every time we can unlock entry into a new field, when we can get those animal models, we can get those ter terrific you know, in vitro models, that's going to be the lang that's going to be the love language of our partners at groups like the NIH, you know. And once we can start getting that data, we can see, I hope, unlock massive amounts of more money. If we are unsuccessful in doing that, I would be rather pessimistic. But I think what we could see from the things that we were you already saw earlier today that there's a lot of very good basic data coming out that should start unlocking that that extra funding. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, and thank you for all the good work that all the researchers are doing.